I think that the annualized rate of return of Bitcoin does diminish over time, but I don't necessarily think that the peak cycle behavior, like what we saw the, the dampened peak back in 2021, I think that was a fluke. So I don't think it's going to continue like that. And I know there's I some prominent people over on Twitter X who believe that the cycle peaks are diminishing. And I just disagree with that. I think what happened in 2021 was it, we were on our way to Bitcoin heading up above 100,000 and I had about 125,000 targeted. And then China did that ban and they came out of left field and they, within a month, dropped the hash rate of Bitcoin by about 50% or so. And that was a legitimate exogenous shock to the Bitcoin network. Because of that, I think that was a fluke. And I think people who base too much research off that, I think are going to be wrong. They're going to miss uh, some upside potential. They're all selling out at 200K because I think that's the appropriate peak. They have the uh, chance of missing out. I mean, my price target is 475,000 for the fourth quarter of 2025. And that might be low. It, it could be too high, but but it could also be too low. I could see Bitcoin going up to seven or 800,000 or even touching a million dollars this cycle before 2025 is over. All right, Dr. Jeff Ross, welcome to Bitcoin for Millennials. Thanks, Bram. I really appreciate the invite to be here. Yeah, thanks for coming on. I'm digging the shirt. I, <laughs> I think uh, we could definitely dive right into the team that I wanted to start with, with which is you know the United States financial situation. Obviously, I am looking at it from a, a, a distance. You are in the US, so I, I think you have some good uh, insights on it. But, you know, the, the financial situation is in a very bad shape. The interest payments are now more than the annual defense budget. We just got our first round of rate cuts. The M2 money supply is growing. A lot of people are projecting a recession. And yeah, I just wanted to start with your current take on all of this. Oh man. Well, you, that's a lot of things to talk about. So I'll, I'll try to, I'll try to hit on the some summary. of them. Sure. <laughs> yeah. Sure. Well, first of all, I'll say something dramatic is I do not think we are headed into a recession. I think with the, the metrics I look at, the business cycle metrics, I think that parts of the economy here in the U S are in a recession. Manufacturing in particular has been in a recession for quite a while, and it's been a, having a hard time getting out of that. However, the services sector, which is much more prominent in the U.S. and a much larger contributor to GDP, is actually doing really well. It's actually expansionary and doing quite well. We did have a little bit of a blip in September where the September data is kind of weak and we actually had a bit of economic weakness and a little bit of deflationary impulse as well. That's usually when you have that combination that can be pretty scary. That's what you usually see in bear markets and during recessions. However, that's just a blip. And I, I think that the data heading forward is going to get much better. So from a business cycle perspective, I actually think that things are going to look good and probably surprise to the upside here in the US, including manufacturing. I also think that inflation, I think, is going to bottom here in the next month or two, if it hasn't already, probably mm. September. So, so when we get the October data for September of the CPI, I think that will probably be the local bottom and then we'll start to slowly increase again. And inflation, a little bit of inflation is actually good for the economy. I don't think we're going to have a, a double peak like people talk about from the 1970s. I think we just have a little bit higher inflation than, than what we've been seeing so far. So that's actually healthy risk assets like stocks uh, tend to do well. Bitcoin tends to do very well in those types of environments. So I'm, I'm looking forward to that, actually. What else do I want to say? So a lot of people are talking about unemployment. I think unemployment is just normalizing. I think most of the data in the U.S. is just simply normalizing. And, and that's because we had such a crazy hit to the system during COVID, right? And all the policies that happened where the supply chain was basically grinded or ground to a halt. And then and here in the U.S. anyways, we just did these massive transfer payments where they, they put tons of cash into people's bank accounts. Uh, and that, that caused that spike in CPI. So that price inflation was a direct result of those two things. And then we've just been working through that. And it, it threw off the business cycle because, you know, the whole supply chain was knocked out for a while. Some mm. services industry things like, like virtual things did really well. Zoom did extremely well. Peloton did extremely well, things like that. And all of that whole process has taken some time to work through the system. And now that that price inflationary impulse has worked through, we're just now on the other side of that. And I think we're, the economy is bottoming, but the economy is still weak enough and inflation is low enough that now the central banks are getting behind the economy. So they're starting to do easing policies, lowering interest rates. And when we see these lower interest rates, 
what that does is it helps expand global M2. And global M2, I believe, is what is the primary driver of risk assets and especially of Bitcoin. So I'm very optimistic for the next 12 to 14 months or so. Yeah. Could you share a bit about how you judge this data? Like, for example, CPI, I think is an interesting, you know, way to measure inflation that also changes all the time, right? Right. But also, for example, job numbers, right? Like, uh, you know, jobs are growing, but then they're not saying that they're growing mostly in government related jobs, right? Yes. Um, So that's that's a trick. Like, can you share a bit about how you judge these official numbers. And, sure. So yeah. all of the official numbers, I'm skeptical of all of them. And I think that you know, it's like the CPI is a perfect example. It changes every year with how the metrics they use to measure CPI. And and as most people know, true inflation, right? Or if we use the same sort of metrics as we did back in the early 1980s, true inflation is technically much higher, or it had been much higher. I should say it, when you look at the true inflation site now, inflation actually is quite low. And so that's that's as expected. I look at all government data with a grain of salt. They have their agendas, like everybody has their agenda and their biases, and they don't want, I think government does not want the people to know how severe inflation is in general. They don't want people to know the truth of inflation, that it's just stealing the purchasing power from the people and, and taking it for the government. So I think it behooves them to make inflation over time look as low as possible. So, but with that said, as a fund manager, you can still glean a lot of information from these trends. So even if the data is faulty, even if the jobs data is faulty, and then they've gone back and revised all the numbers lower. And to your point, tons of the job gains over the last year were actually government-related jobs, which makes makes me sad. It, it hurts my heart to see so many new government jobs, but it is what it is. So yes, those things distort the metrics, but you can still see trends in general. I think those trends are extremely helpful, even if their numbers are off by you know one, two, three, four percent, say in, in CPI metrics. It's still what what I think matters more as an investor, as a fund manager, um, is are they accelerating? Are they peaking? Are they decelerating? You know, or basing? So this whole sine wave is how the whole economy tends to move. It's how inflation tends to move as well. I glean a lot of information off of that, even though the the data is sort of manipulated and faulty. Yeah, of course, I want to talk about Bitcoin a bit later on. But but when you said you know risk on, risk off, isn't that? Do you think Bitcoin fits in? A traditional view of risk on and risk off because for me as someone without like a finance background for me bitcoin is like the lowest <laughs> like the least risky thing that i can own you know Th- that takes some time before you get there but i find it very interesting that people who invest or trade in bitcoin i would assume mostly are not there yet that's why they, you know we have the volatility etc but yeah how, how do you look at that exactly and so i slip back and forth when i'm talking about these things because of exactly what you're mentioning for bitcoiners who have put in the time like we have we we view bitcoin as the least risky asset available so i think the more you understand bitcoin the more you feel comfortable with it even though it's volatile and the more bitcoin you want to own but for the majority of market participants, they still don't know the difference between Bitcoin and other proof of stake cryptocurrencies. They still think of yeah. Bitcoin like a small tech, tech stock or something like that. And so, yes, so so for the majority of market participants, it gets treated as a risk on asset. That's why we talk about that. So, so when we get back into a risk environment, so when liquidity is flowing, when the M2 money supply is increasing, People tend to move further out on that risk curve. And for most people, Bitcoin is way out on that risk curve. And then a little further is, you know, proof of stake crypto nonsense. And so and that's fine. That's just how the markets work. But eventually the world will understand. And I think probably 10 years, maybe in the 2030s to 2040s somewhere, then people will finally understand what Bitcoin is. And then it will be seen as the ultimate risk off asset. At that point, too, I think it will be not only the worldwide medium of exchange of choice, but it will also be the unit of account for the world, like kind of how treasuries and the US dollar are today. I think by 2040, 2050 in that time period, which feels like a long ways away, but it's not that far on the arc of history. I think by that time, Bitcoin will be seen as the ultimate risk off asset and unit of account. Does your Bitcoin custody setup keep you up at night? Gain peace of mind with OnRamp and their multi-institution custody solution. OnRamp creates a dedicated multi-signature vault for you and three separate institutions each hold a key, which are OnRamp, Bitco and CoinCover. But none of them can move funds unilaterally, only you have control. These institutions can only sign with your instruction. OnRamp's multi-institution custody eliminates single points of failure, 
reduces your personal tax service and technical burden, and provides access to financial services that allow you to secure your Bitcoin, including inheritance planning, insurance-backed warranties for all balances and transactions, low-cost trading, and more. Check out onrampbitcoin.com through my link in the description below and receive $250 in Bitcoin when you join. Yeah, I'd say that that could perhaps be within 10 years. You know, I like the, I think Seder, Seder kind of illustrated that, right? Like until 2033 or in 2033, we'll have 99% of all the Bitcoin mined. Mm -hmm. I think there will be an inflection point kind of there, right? Like at some point when countries start stacking and they realize, oh, the, you know, the, the last 1% is going to take 100, what is it, 16 years. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, 106 years, I think. 107, six years. Yeah, yeah, exactly. yeah, somewhere in there. Yeah, that's that's going to be crazy. But yeah, it's interesting how in Bitcoin, you're always tested for your long-term <laughs> conviction, right? So Definitely. when you say, you know, in 27 years, we'll see this and this. Yeah, that's fun. You know, that, that <laughs> that's also why, uh, for me, at least, Bitcoin is very entertaining to follow, right? Because we know we're going to talk about it for the next, you know, rest of our lives. Probably. Definitely. So, yeah, yep. fun. So are there any other macro developments that you are following and... What is their impact on Bitcoin as far as you see it? So the the thing that I like to talk about a little bit is just because it happened recently with the Federal Reserve lowering the federal funds rate. Here in the United States, that directly affects something called the prime rate. And the prime rate is what all of short-term variable debt or most of short-term variable debt is based off of. So for people in, in the U.S. that have home equity lines of credit or HELOCs, we call them, credit card debt or small business loans, those kind of things, those are all generally based on that prime rate. So what's interesting about that is the Fed just lowered the federal funds rate by 50 basis points or half a percent. What happens then is immediately after that, the prime rate went down from 8.5 down to 8%. And all of the debt that people have, whether it's these home equity loans, small business loans, or credit card debt, or similar kind of debt instruments, they now have lower payments. It's literally the next day that changed and lowered for everybody. So now all Americans who have that kind of debt, most Americans, I should say, that have that kind of debt now have lower debt payments. So that actually helps with their monthly cash flows. It means that they do have more cash in the bank that they can use. And that's that's what I'm. how we see that. People ask, well, how can the global M2 be rising just based off of something that the, the Federal Reserve does? That's a great reason how that happens. That's one one way that happens is that now Americans have more cash in the bank and they can use that cash, you know, to buy groceries or whatever they want to buy, but they can also buy Bitcoin or buy stocks with it. So it tends to be good for asset markets. And then that say this in the same fashion rates are lower for people around the world and people who have US uh, dollar denominated debt because the dollar has been weakening relatively that means they have a stronger exchange rate and that makes paying off this U.S. denominated debt easier so that these emerging markets and other you know, debt-laden societies around the world, they'll just have more cash available. Uh, and, and that just drives up global M2 and a rising global M2 eventually finds its way into Bitcoin. So again, that's another reason why I'm very bullish. I think as the economy starts to bottom, both in the U.S., in Europe, which is still lagging, but, but I think it's getting close to a bottom as well. And even in China, China just announced yesterday of support for the Chinese markets, all of that is going to increase the amount of liquidity into the system. And, and a lot of that will find its way into Bitcoin. So how should people look at the effect of this? So you lower the rates, people can borrow more, M2 money supply grows, which devalues the existing currency units, which eventually leads to rising prices, right? So it's kind of like this perpetual cycle almost. What, what, what is the longer term effect of, of this? The long-term effect is really unfortunate. So this is what I hate about the Keynesian economic system and this credit-based system that the that the dollar and U.S. Treasuries push throughout the world um, is this debt-based system where you're either a have or you're a have-not. I call it the K-shaped economy. Lots of people use that analogy. If you are in the Good owner point. class, right? If you own a house or you own a business and you own stocks and you own Bitcoin, you are very happy. Uh, to see this inflation happen because this debasement leads to your net worth, at least in nominal terms, increasing substantially, usually a little bit faster than the rate of CPI um, here, in, here in the United States. If you're in the renter class, though, that's the lower income class, you're renting, you don't own stocks, you don't own Bitcoin, you, you, know, you don't own your own home. 
life just gets more and more expensive. And so you create this income gap. It's this income inequality that gets worse and worse and worse. And it's basically at historically high levels here in the United States. The unfortunate thing about that is it doesn't usually end until the currency breaks and or there's some kind of coup or civil war or some sort of uprising. Because And and that's understandable because the lower class is struggling so hard to make ends meet just to afford life, a basic, uh, you know, food and shelter, and they can barely afford it right now. And it's only getting worse. So Bitcoin obviously is a solution to this, but it's still too early uh, for it to become the worldwide player and to change the whole monetary system. So in this meantime, we're in this really ugly transition zone, and it's it's going to be tough for several more years, I think. Yeah. So where do you think we are at in in the current cycle of Bitcoin? In terms of what, like for the progression of Bitcoin acceptance? Yeah, so for example, we we obviously had the the halving this year, right? I think, at least for me, that's where I measure the the cycles from and to. Yeah. Um, Okay, so so yeah, so I, I think we're in a very good spot for Bitcoin. I, I, I officially transitioned, I called, I say Dr. Bull. I've been Dr. Bull Crab for a long time <laughs> because all these metrics of liquidity were chopping sideways and, and the price of Bitcoin followed along for the last couple of quarters. I think now all of the groundwork is laid for Bitcoin to move higher. So I'm very constructive, very bullish for the next 13 months or so, 13, 14 months, basically into the fourth quarter of 2025. I think all of the conditions are in place where we have central banks kind of backing the markets now at this point. Inflation isn't as big of a concern. The markets are weak, but they're not terrible and they're not recessionary. And liquidity is expanding and global M2 is expanding. So all of that is very bullish historically for Bitcoin based on past cycles. So I think that it's likely that we will see that we will see another exponential move higher as we head into 2025. I'm, I'm, uh, especially the like the third quarter of 2025, I think is going to be very exciting. Yeah. How do you see the, the ETFs evolving and, and what is your general view on them? Like, do you see them as kind of a Trojan horse? It's a good question. So I have mixed feelings about it. So first of all, I will say none of this is surprising. I think for those of us who have been in the Bitcoin space for a long time, we knew that eventually Wall Street would start participating and they want to get their hands in there and they want to get their fees and stuff. That is good. I think it's generally good for the price appreciation of Bitcoin that we have these ETFs now makes it very easy for anyone to own. It's not owning real Bitcoin. It's owning a Bitcoin IOU, right? Because you're trusting the custodianship of these of these companies. And then you're giving them a small management fee as well. I think it's a good first step. And I think it's inevitable. And I kind of like the way Sailor talks about it as being like a, a layer two application of Bitcoin is, is an ETF. And that's fine. It will help people. It will basically strengthen the network overall. I do get concerned, though, right? The more Bitcoin that collects in these ETFs and it's held at like Coinbase as the custodian and it's sort of under the control of BlackRock and these other huge institutions, that that raises some alarm bells a little bit for me as well. And so I still think it's fine if people want to have that be your first step into Bitcoin. But I always counsel people, you should definitely, though, still own Bitcoin and cold storage, get it off of exchanges, get it out of ETFs. If it's an IOU, as most people know, you don't think about it when times are good. But when you're in a financial crisis, if you have your money in a bank or you have your money somewhere else and you're trusting somebody else, there's a chance they can just take your money. You don't really own the money that is in the bank, even though it's under your name. Yeah. Just like you don't technically own the Bitcoin if, if you hold a share of the, the ETF. So that's how I feel about it. Yeah, this is this has been like my biggest argument as of late. I had an interesting conversation with someone who didn't have any Bitcoin, but she was really interested to learn about it. But she's like all into stocks. And I just had the argument, you know, when all hell breaks loose, are you going to call the stockbroker and be like, you know, can I cash out? Just like <laughs> all the other people that are calling. You right, know? Right. And then she looked at me, she was like, damn. You're right. And I was like, yeah, it's that simple. It's that simple, right. you know. And and there are things that people maybe don't think about, but like during the the global financial crisis back in 2008, 2009, there the the I believe the SEC came in and actually made it so it was illegal to short some of these stocks that people knew were going to crash and burn some of these banks and financial mm-hmm. institutions. There's they could do the same thing with, you know, if for people who want to hedge their exposure to, to these kind of things, the, the, the who knows, the regulators could just step in and be like, you know what, it's illegal to short, you can't do that. Or we're going to seize your assets, or we're going to pull a 3102, 6102, excuse me, as like FDR did back in the day. We just don't know what people are going to do when things get bad. And so just, man, 
at least own some. And I, I ideally, people should own the majority of their Bitcoin in cold storage off of exchanges and outside of ETFs. Yeah, what you just said, like, I, I am not a trader. <laughs> you know, I uh, when I discovered Bitcoin, I, I did trade. But after three months, I was like, you know, this is not for me. But the realization that what you just said, you know, the SEC came in, you know, prohibited people from from shorting stocks. For me, it's so funny to see because I'm like, OK, but people can play this game, but not really. You know, you can play the long game, you can play the short game, you can play this entire stock game. But when shit hits the fan, the game just stops. So it's not yep. a real game. You know, it's always a controlled game, you know, like like realizations like that have really strengthened kind of my belief in in Bitcoin because yeah, these are just games for, yeah, it's just a game. Right. It's a rigged game. And, it, and, and it's, we live in a, we don't live in free markets. We live in a centrally controlled system. And so, and people, you know, I see people on some side of the political aisle get upset with America because this is free markets and capitalism is terrible because look at all these, mm -hmm. you know, bad things. Like this is not free market at all. Not even close. This is centrally controlled, yes. centrally manipulated market behavior. And so there are lots of downsides and people who have been around long enough, like I have, you're, you're younger than I am, but, you know, been around for 2000 and seen the dot com crash and seen the, the rise and crazy rise in real estate and people taking out four or five, six uh, mortgages back in the early 2000s and then the global financial crisis and all of these things that have happened along the way, all they do is make you think this is just a clown world. It, it is like a game. It's like they're, they're these kids who are in charge who don't really understand or don't care about the second order effects of the things that they're doing. And it's affecting the entire world and people really suffer if they don't mm -hmm. understand how to play the game. Yeah. And it's you can benefit from it if you know what you're doing. But I feel terrible for the people that, you know, they're so busy working and they just don't have time to understand the system or don't have the ability to understand the system. And they just get screwed by the system. And it's really unfortunate. Yeah. So how do you see future Bitcoin cycles develop? Do you believe in diminishing return? So so let's see. How do I say this? I, I think that the annualized rate of return of Bitcoin does diminish over time. But I don't necessarily think that the peak cycle behavior, like what we saw, the, the dampened peak back in 2021, I think that was a fluke. So I don't think it's going to continue like that. And I know there's I some prominent people over on Twitter X who believe that the cycle peaks are diminishing. And I just disagree with that. I think what happened in 2021 was it, we were on our way to Bitcoin heading up above 100,000 and I had about 125,000 targeted. And then China did that ban and they came out of left field and they and they literally uh, within a month dropped the hash rate of Bitcoin by about 50 percent or so. And that was a legitimate exogenous shock to the Bitcoin network that took time to recover from. And all the miners had to relocate in different parts of the world. Uh, people had to sell tons of Bitcoin to, to pay for these kind of things. That was a huge shock. Basically, it's almost like a meteor coming and, and hitting the earth and it had to recover from that. Because of that, I think that by the time Bitcoin price started to recover and got back up to about 69,000, by that point, the, the the liquidity cycle was was starting to roll over. It was already uh, peaking and was going to roll over. So global M2 was heading over and people saw that inflation was going to be a concern. The economy was getting a little hot. So they were starting to put the brakes on. And so Bitcoin didn't have a chance to do that long last push, that exponential push higher. So anyways, because of that, I think that was a fluke. And I think people who base too much research off that, I think are going to be wrong to the, they're going to miss uh, some upside potential. They're all selling out at 200K because they think that's the appropriate peak. Um, they have the uh, chance of missing out. On, I, I mean, my price target is 475,000 for the fourth quarter of 2025. And that might be low. It, it could be too high, but, but it could also be too low. I could see Bitcoin going up to seven or 800,000 or even touching a million dollars this cycle before 2025 is over. Well, this was my next question. So thanks for, <laughs> thanks for taking that. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I really agree that uh, that 2020 run was cut short. And the funny thing is that, you know, all the models have already been destroyed, I would say. Right. Mm -hmm. Because uh, mm -hmm. I think this is, I don't know what you think of stock to flow and stuff like that. But, you know, this is what people, some people were saying, like, yeah, I was counting on 100K because stock to flow, blah, blah, blah. And then it didn't happen. So stock to flow sucks. But uh, I think the reason you just gave is very, very reasonable one. And I would agree that it was definitely uh, cut short. So I don't think we, re we really know what's going to come. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you look at retail interest, for example, it's probably 
pretty low, you know, really buying physical Bitcoin and, and, and self-custody, et cetera. Perhaps the retail interest is a bit higher with the ETFs up until now. But again, you know, that's not real. That's not real Bitcoin. But yeah, I'm also interested to see where, where that goes. I really hope retail does not miss out on this, on this part because people will be eventually priced out. Right. I mean, if we get to, let's say between 500 K and a million, and then we have a 80% drawback again, that's still out of reach for the majority of people. Right. And unfortunately people do the wrong thing usually, right? Most people trade based on their emotions. And so I know a lot of people who are giving up right now. They've, they've like, Hey, I've been here since 2021. They piled in at the peak or near the peak around 50 or 60 K they've held it through the big drawdown and it came up and they're like, you know what? I, I'm going to, I basically broke even right now at this price. I'm out and we'll see. And I, I, I plead with them. I'm like, this is not the time to get out. This is the, this is the time right before things start to get exciting again, where nobody believes it's going to happen. And then suddenly it just takes off. And, and I was talking to American HODL yesterday and in the last couple of days, we've been talking about this for both of us who have been around for a while. It feels just like it did back in 2020 right before things started to get exciting again, everybody was kind of bored with it. People were wondering, you know, are yep. we going to go into a recession? And, you know, the presidential thing is, is, is nobody knows who's going to get elected, all this kind of stuff. And then suddenly it just takes off when nobody's looking. And, and before you know it, I think we'll be above a hundred K and we'll be shooting higher. And so unfortunately, a lot of these retail investors, I think are going to pile in when it's like two or 300 K and then they're mm. going to ride it up for a little bit. And then they're going to ride it down 75%, I think, unfortunately. Yeah. But. I, I actually, I, I was, I was in this Reddit discussion and people were talking about this, like, does this reminisce of 16, 17, et cetera? And mm -hmm. I was like, yeah, yes. yes. Like I, I am finally now, you know, when you see these little green candles, I was like, I'm thinking, oh yeah, that's how it was. Right. Like yes. it's, it's funny when, and if you've been in, in, in Bitcoin for a longer time, you will recognize this. And I think this will also be the, the best period to, ex to, to experience if you've been in this from 2021, this is what Bitcoin is about. It's not going to take super long in, in the bigger scheme of things. Right. But then you'll be like, okay, you know, if it gets to, you know, 500 K you're going to be like, okay, this, this thing is not going to zero. And I think eventually that's what people need to realize. It's that's my thesis is it's either zero or it's everything. I don't really yeah. think there's like a middle, middle ground scenario for, for Bitcoin over a long enough time frame, Right. So yeah, once you realize that it, it survived all these drawbacks and now it goes to a crazy height again, that's kind of where the conviction I would say start starts yes. also for, for the morning work people. Yeah. So how can people prepare for what is next with this macro play, with what's happening in the States, your idea of this cycle? Yeah. So I actually just posted on Nostra this morning, uh, this exact same question. I'm of the opinion that we're at the very beginning of the next bull move higher. And that it's not just Bitcoin. I think risk assets in general. So I, even though stocks are very overvalued, people keep talking about the CAPE ratio and price to sales and things like that, that the metrics that people look at for valuation. Technology stocks are very highly valued right now, but that doesn't mean they can't go higher. And the whole point of liquidity is when you have liquidity coming into the system, that causes multiple expansion on risk assets. Just like when liquidity was withdrawn, it causes multiple contraction. It doesn't really matter what the valuations are, is whether or not the multiples are expanding or contracting. And that's a direct result of the underlying liquidity. Almost nobody understands that, but but that's a huge, hugely important like lesson for investing in general. And so how should people respond? I think this is not the time to be too cautious. There, I, I know lots of people who are sitting in cash and short-term uh, T-bills and some gold, which is gold that's done well, but cash and T-bills, you know, they're happy earning their 5%. Uh, T-bill and chill, I think they like to say. And I'm just like, that's fine, but you are going to miss out. And by the time they get over their fears of this recession that they think is coming, which I uh, truly believe is not coming here in the United States anytime soon, at the, at the earliest, maybe by the end of 2025, but probably somewhere in 2026, 
they're going to be sitting on the sidelines and they're probably going to miss the first 100% move of Bitcoin. Like they, they probably won't get in until it's up around the 120, 150,000 range. That's fine. And they'll still get to ride it up for a little bit longer. But if I, I just like to encourage people, there are times to be cautious and there are times to be aggressive and to be bold. And I, I believe, and I could be wrong, but I believe that right now is a time to be aggressive and to be bold. This is where you make money because you, you make hay while the sun shines and the sun is starting to shine now. To go back to that, risk part how how do you define risk in like financial terms we just mentioned you know if you study bitcoin long enough yeah. then you know it'll probably be the lowest you know least risky thing that you can own obviously not a lot of people are there yet yeah what's what's the gap there how, how should right. they view it well that's this is another thing that's that's often said so among finance traditional finance people and a lot of investment advisors and people i got my mba in finance years ago and I learned the same stuff. It's it's risk equals volatility, right? And so people are very concerned about volatility and they hate volatile ap- assets. And I tell people that risk only equals volatility in academia. Their true financial risk is the chance of losing your purchasing power over time. And so if you are sitting in treasuries that are actually, you know, you're getting 5% nominally, but you may be losing money in real t- purchasing power terms, that is very risky. If even if it's even if it's not volatile, if you just know that you're declining, your purchasing power is declining over time in bonds or in low volatile stocks or in whatever asset, maybe real estate or gold. Pick pick your pick your asset. That is true risk. The risk of losing your purchasing power over time. And so, one thing that Bitcoin has shown uh, over its first fifteen years of existence, even though it's volatile it drastically increases your purchasing power over time. And so I think it's an integral part or it should be an integral part of everybody's portfolio. Everyone should have at least some exposure to Bitcoin. And the more you understand Bitcoin, the more you'll own Bitcoin. And so people always ask me what what number, you know, what percentage should they have in their portfolio? And I say, you'll, be, you'll increase your percentage of, of Bitcoin the longer you, or the more you understand Bitcoin and the more time you put into studying Bitcoin. So that that's very interesting. Some people think one percent of Bitcoin exposure is just crazy. They think, how could I how could I expose myself to that much risk and that much volatility? And I'm like, I know other people that are on the other side that have a hundred percent or a hundred and fifty percent exposure because they're levered long Bitcoin. And I'm not I'm recommending that, but it's just because they're comfortable with it and they understand it. So yeah, it's very interesting. I think this is an interesting counter argument. Yeah, like I. I I wanted to ask you what 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 is that counter argument to you know Bitcoin is too volatile. I usually share you know what what do you expect from a market that trades twenty four seven three sixty five globally? You know the 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 price is a proxy for adoption in my in my opinion, right? Mm-hmm. That perhaps combined with let's say like hold all rates or so, something like that, where you can see you know well if, if you truly understand it, you do not trade it. Right. right. And and the big swings up and down, they come from all the leveraged people. And again, you know, if you truly understand it, you don't gamble. <laughs> with yep. it, right. So that's the same yep. argument. But I think this is interesting too, right? This kind of more talks about the problem that people have is that they're using a money that's being devalued over time and, you know, doing nothing is very risky. And then from all the options that you have to eventually protect yourself over a long time frame. Yeah, this is probably the least risky one. Right. And it's so funny when you put it in those kind of terms. If you just think of Bitcoin as savings technology and compare it to the dollar, I'm like, well, would you rather get wealthier but with volatility over time? Or would you rather get poorer with no volatility over time? Because that's you can get no volatility and just have all your money in a bank checking or savings account, but you'll literally be poorer over, over time. It's just a fact. Yeah. Just like it's a fact that you'll gain, you'll increase in purchasing power the longer you hold Bitcoin. So... Mm. It's it's funny. People are love, funny. Yeah, I love putting home prices in Bitcoin. Yeah, like like over ten years, you know, you go from like fifteen hundred Bitcoin to you know six. Yes, it's incredible. Yeah, love that. So, mm-hmm. how do you stomach still like these big swings that 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 occur over these four years? Like, do you still feel it when you look at the number go down? It depends what we're. T- so, I'm two different people. I'm I'm me, Jeff, the guy who owns Bitcoin personally, and then I'm the fund manager. So, for my fund manager, it's different. What I try to do is try to decrease that that volatility and those huge swings. And what I do is I do I do use market timing type things that are based on these liquidity pictures. 
And so if we do happen to have a huge swing higher and it goes exponential and it goes up to say 500,000 or something like that in 2025, what I would probably do at that point is I would hedge to the downside because I would expect that we're going to have another sort of bear market and I would try to protect my investors from that. So there's easy ways. In fact, we just found out iBit now you can you can trade options on. And so I think by next this time next year, we'll be able to trade options on all of the ETFs, not to mention things like MicroStrategy and Bitcoin miners. And so what I think works pretty well is if you have that huge run up and have those gigantic shorter term gains, you can just simply buy puts or you can short these different equities, these Bitcoin proxies and protect your stash of Bitcoin without having to sell your core allocation to Bitcoin. Um, that helps for hedge fund returns. You know, the whole point of a hedge fund is to hedge and, and to help, you know, decrease the volatility for my investors over time. So that's my hedge fund. Personally, I don't care at all. I'm to the point where I don't mind the fluctuations. I just dollar cost average into Bitcoin and don't think about it at all. And it does get easier over time. I think mm. we're similar. We've been in Bitcoin since about 2015, 2016. Once you've been through multiple cycles, it just doesn't bother you that much anymore. And so I, I don't really care. Even if it goes up to 500, I'll be like, cool, it's up to 500. And then if it drops back down to 70,000, I'll be like, that's great. I'll buy more. Yeah, I agree. I do still feel it. I don't know. Like the numbers do still still do something, but I don't, I, I don't, it's like the psychology behind that. Like, do you do you have a do you have a trick? I don't know. Like, I think we are both at the same conviction level, but yeah. I think it's just it still does something to you. And I, although I even know, you know, it's about the amount of Bitcoin. You need more Bitcoin. It's not about the right. dollar amount. Yeah. That then that's the point. That's that's what I try to do is I've you know I've I, for a long time I'm, I work in finance so for a long time I've been checking my net worth on a, a monthly basis in dollar terms. But about four years ago I I did it not only in dollar terms but I do it in Bitcoin terms now and it just changes everything. It's so interesting. So even whether things are fluctuating or going way up or way down. I'm just like, you know what? I have a little more Bitcoin this month than I did last month. And that's a good thing. Um, and for some reason, it doesn't bother as much. And then another thing is, I think when you when your cost basis is low enough that you realize that the price, even in a bad bear market, won't probably won't go below your cost basis, you can kind of relax too and just ride it out. I mean, I, I have my convictions of where I think Bitcoin is going to be in 10 years, in 20 years. And I try to keep that in mind. Um, that anything I you know sell today, I'll regret it deeply twenty or ten years from now or so, and so just kind of just keep holding on and 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 yeah. not worrying so much about the fiat value of it because I know to, in my heart that Bitcoin, regardless of the fiat price, that uh, you know Bitcoin is price go down technology, so the the price of everything will get cheaper and cheaper and cheaper over time in Bitcoin, regardless of uh, what fiat currency we hold. Yeah. So can you? Maybe explain a bit about this options trading. I saw people talk about what they call a gamma gamma squeeze. Again, I'm not a trader, but I, I thought it was an interesting term. Um, I, my basic understanding of that is because Bitcoin has a finite supply, when people have to cover their calls, they have to call, they have to buy Bitcoin, which raises the price, you know, and, and that, that kind of starts this cycle of price up, uh, more buying, etc. Right. Yep. So just to your point, and that it's actually almost the exact opposite, at least the way I think about it is when the price goes down in a bear market really severely because we're getting margin calls. I call that a leverage long liquidation cascade. And so you can get that cascade higher, though, during bull markets, to your point. So when people and this is one of my things that I try to tell people, especially if you're new to the Bitcoin space, you have no idea how fast the price can go higher during a bull market, a raging bull market. And I think it's very unwise to do a covered call strategy during a bull market um, because you're going to hit, you're going to get hit and the price will surge past it and you're going to be forced to buy it. And, and you're not going to be enjoying the upside gains that you could if you would just simply buy and hold it not play these little games. And so I love that. Th yeah, yeah, the strategies can work well, but most people aren't smart enough. And most people mm. put on leverage and use options at exactly the wrong time. They get all excited. And that's what's going to happen this time too. I'm fairly convinced if, if it's anything like past cycles is we'll be in the third quarter probably of 2025 and the price will be ripping higher, maybe 200 to 300,000 or something. And people are going to pile on leverage and they're going to pile on call options because they're going to be convinced that Bitcoin is going to go to a million or something like that. 
and they're going to do all that at exactly the wrong time. And 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 uh, you know, if they do their, if they stagger their, well, tins, then, yeah, right? exactly, exactly, <laughs> right. For the people who are just sitting there watching it and, and holding, it'll be mm-hmm. great. But I don't know. I feel like it's sort of my duty to try to help people and protect people and and prevent people from making dumb mistakes. But people, people are emotional and they, they buy when they're, when they have FOMO and they sell when they have FUD. And that's the exact wrong thing to do in any yeah. asset class, but especially in Bitcoin. Yeah, it is why Bitcoin is so entertaining for yes. me. I've shared this a few times on the podcast, but I once read like a tweet from someone who said, you know, if you think Bitcoin, you know, again, Bitcoin is an experiment, it goes to zero or everything. If you even remotely think it goes to everything, you should have a seat in the stadium because then you can watch it all unfold, right? Like, yes. and, and what we're talking about is exactly how I feel about that. You know, like That's great. It's, it's just very entertaining. Mm-hmm. You know, it's people are trying to play this game on Bitcoin, but Bitcoin doesn't really allow that. And, and that is entertaining to me. Yes. Uh, it's such a paradigm shift in that sense as well. Yeah, fun. Yeah, why why is Bitcoin such a big idea? I think it is a once in a species invention, and it's it's technology that I really believe is going to reshape the world. It's going to shape humanity in a different way. And I don't like to, a lot of people get sort of religious about this, and I don't like that. But but to build societies and governments and families on Bitcoin is just completely different than anything that humans have ever experienced before. The closest we had was maybe a gold back system, which was a fairly accurate measuring stick. It just incentivizes completely different human behavior. And it incentivizes, you know, it's proof of work technology. And it, it you have to put energy and work into it in order to accumulate it. And that's awesome. And it's awesome for people who have suffered, going back to what we were originally talking about with the broken money and income inequality, the people who are kind of in the lower income strata right now all around the world, they will benefit greatly from this because all they got to do is work and save. And if you can save in Bitcoin, you will your purchasing power will increase over time. And for people who think that helps you to think with that low time preference, instead of just thinking about tomorrow and how am I going to pay my bills next week or next month, you can start thinking about decades ahead. And you can start, I, I, I call it, I think we're going to have what I call it the age of legends. I think we're going to have this new, almost a renaissance of humanity doing incredible things because you can start planning 10 years out, 100 years out, 500 years out, because we know that Bitcoin will preserve and appreciate your uh, purchasing power over time and over space. And it's it's really incredible. We've never experienced this as humanity. So I'm excited to, unfortunately, I'll be dead probably before a lot of this cool stuff will happen, yeah, but I'm sucks, excited. Uh, oh, yeah, maybe I, we'll have to cryo something. Cryo maybe, chamber. maybe. <laughs> but I'm excited for my grandkids and, you know, future yeah. uh, great grandkids. It'll be a, a better world. Yeah, I 100% agree with this. I, I love personally that there's other people that, come to the same conclusion that that i think for me is really why bitcoin brings hope in that sense how cool would it be if this actually plays out and Mm -hmm. i think it's possible with bitcoin but why do you think so few people currently understand you know how broken the money is that inflation is actual theft of your energy obviously that's on purpose nobody teaches us in school but yeah people do feel it you know like Mm-hmm. The bread is ten dollars, or you know, the watermelon is twelve dollars. Right. Well, I think the first point to, to what you said: nobody teaches it in school. Most teachers don't understand that. And then I think what happens is, for the people who are really suffering the most from inflation, they tend to just believe what the politicians tell them and what the headlines say. And the politics, you know, Elizabeth Warren gets on and says it's greedy corporations that are causing your inflation, and and. Kamala Harris gets on and says, grocery stores are price gouging, and that's why your groceries are so expensive. And that's just a flat out lie. Either They're either stupid or they're lying. And I don't think either of them yeah. are stupid. So I think they're lying. And that's an egregious sin. It's terrible that people do that. And they're, they're misleading people. And the government benefits greatly through inflation because it's theft. It's just a slow theft of purchasing power from their citizens. And so... I just think nobody knows and nobody is incentivized to know. But the, the funny thing is, is Bitcoin is forcing the issue because it's a different kind of money and because it's perfectly scarce and decentralized and neutral uh, energy money. It, it, it suddenly people have to think, well, wait, how is this different from regular money? You know, and, and I mm-hmm. think, you know, polls are taken regularly here in the U.S. Most or a good a large majority of Americans still think the dollar is backed by gold. 
It hasn't been backed by gold for, really? 50, for 53 years. It hasn't been backed by gold, but a lot of oh. Americans think it is. And and so so people start asking like what is money? Why does a dollar have value? Why? And that's how I talk to regular people who maybe aren't mathematically inclined or economically inclined. I just say, isn't it crazy how how expensive groceries are now? Or like if you go to eat at a restaurant, it's twice as much as it was even just like a year or two ago. And everybody can understand that. And I say, wouldn't it be great if we lived in a world where instead of everything getting more and more expensive, what if it got less and less expensive to your point of the house, right? Like, like what if, what if you could, what if life just got cheaper every year and they'd be like, well, yeah, that'd be amazing. I'm like, that's literally what, that's literally what Bitcoin <laughs> offers you. And I said, wouldn't you want life to get cheaper every year? And they're like, well, of course. And I'm like, that's what Bitcoin offers you. And so anyways, the government, it, it they, they're, they're going to, Government will lose the most, especially the United States government, because they have the largest inflationary debasement system in the world that sucks the sucks purchasing power from every corner of the earth. And so for them to lose that is a big deal. And it's going to be a massive reorganization uh, that Bitcoin will cause. So they, it doesn't behoove them to teach people about Bitcoin. But you know. It's coming. Yeah. It's happening. Yeah, it's interesting. It's like you read my questions up front, but I didn't send you anything. <laughs> but I wanted to ask, you know, how does Bitcoin challenge the traditional understanding of money? But I think this this uh, mm-hmm. was the answer. I think, yeah, once you start asking people, why is the bread so expensive? I always say like the bread was 50 cents in, you know, 1965 and it's five dollars or seven or whatever. Yeah. Currently, like it, what changed? Did the bread change? Should don't you agree that we should be more efficient in creating bread? You know, why isn't bread free? Why are people still hungry? You know, like mm-hmm. that. You know, we talked about flying cars in the what is that, the seventies, sixties, you know, they yes. talk about flying cars. But the bread is now, you know, fifty times more expensive. And yeah, you know, usually people agree that that's weird, you know, but that's always a good kind of like trigger to to go into kind of like this talk where yeah, you can actually ask the question, what is, what is money? And yeah, I talked to uh, I talked to a guy who was uh, who majored in economics, and he said, I never learned what money is in, right. in my entire study. <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah, I have a I got an MBA in finance, and there's not one conversation about what actual money yeah. is. Wild, so, yeah. wild. So yeah, many millennials feel this pain of inflation, you know, but they've been sold a certain way to build wealth or the steps that they should take in their life, right? Like go to school, college, marriage, home, kids, etc. But this is not attainable for the majority of, of millennials. What would be your advice to a millennial that wants to work on growing and protecting their wealth with Bitcoin? Like where, where should they start? I think you just start humbly and you start taking the first step and you start just dollar cost averaging into it. I tell people like, you know, I'm a hedge fund manager. I used to be an investment advisor. So I, th- I, this is the industry I come from. And you don't need people like me. You don't need an investment advisor. You don't need Wall Street. You don't need any of these products that are all built on this crumbling fiat system. That's just this clown world trick. It's it's everybody f- uh, figuring out how to manipulate. And the people who are best at manipulating these dollar-based products, they they gain the wealth and they gain it by siphoning the purchasing power off of people like their clients and and, and the rest of society. And it's tragic. Right. This that's what fiat rewards. It re, it rewards trickery and shenanigans. And I just hate that. So what I would tell millennials and even Gen Zers who are just starting out, start out humbly. All you got to do is you work hard and you make or smart work harder or smarter or both. You save more than you spend. So you have a little bit of money left over at the end of each paycheck. And then put whatever that is. I actually try to tell people try to save up to 30 percent of your take home pay. You can put it in stocks and other stuff if you want to, but I say put the majority of it into Bitcoin and 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 then coming full circle to what we were talking about, the ETFs. Don't I'm not talking about ETFs, I'm saying put it into Bitcoin. So buy Bitcoin and then put it into cold storage and learn about that and get it away from the fiat, the fiat clown world system and protect yourself and your family and your future self by doing that. And if you do that, if you just chip away and put 30% of your take-home pay into Bitcoin every week or every month or whatever your pay schedule is, eventually you will have you will achieve financial independence. And b- b- based on the annualized return rate of Bitcoin relative to other asset classes like stocks or bonds or currencies or gold or real estate or whatever, 
I still think that Bitcoin will be, even though the d- returns are diminishing slowly over time, I think that you will still far outperform all of these other asset classes. So if you just save in Bitcoin, you'll be accre- increasing and protecting your purchasing power over time. And you'll, but 10, 20 years from now, you'll have a lot more optionality than you do currently. Yeah. Yeah, I love that. I, I think I went all in when I realized I can just move, you know, and you can move to another money system. Yes. There's no, you don't have to wait. Yeah, you don't yeah. have to ask permission. That's hard for people, though. Yeah, that's, that's crazy. Yeah, I some know. people <laughs> they some people need to get permission. They need to be told what to do. They're just mm-hmm. that's how they are. Well, but and also that, in this old money system, you outsource the responsibility of of holding the money, mm-hmm. right? So you don't yeah. even realize that that is an option to hold it yourself, right? It feels yeah. strange to people and to take that responsibility, but it's the probably the best financial decision you'll ever make. I yeah. think. So do you see Bitcoin as just a technology or also a kind of philosophy? I think it does. I think it is a philosophy too. And I think it's kind of getting to that high time preference versus low time preference. Um, it, it's an, I think it's an incentive system that incentivizes you to think critically and think in the long term versus in the short term. It's easier to think about what Bitcoin is when you compare it to how it's different from fiat. And fiat creates so much stress. It's, it's unhealthy. It causes divorce. It causes huge problems. And you you spend your life and you and I know lots and lots and lots of people who feel like they've been working a career for 20, 30, 40 years, and they feel like all they do is work for the man. They feel like they're a slave to the system and they can never get ahead. And Bitcoin flips that on its head. Uh, and it, and it's, you take that responsibility upon yourself. And as you save up, you're actually increasing your purchasing power and in, increasing your optionality. And so it does sort of create a different philosophy, a different way to live life. And most Bitcoiners I know, and I know you're probably the same, the ones you know are just generally more relaxed and stress-free. They tend to enjoy their families and their free time more. It's really interesting to see the difference. They're more focused on their health they tend to be pursuers of truth in general, whatever that kind of means. Like they just want to know what is the truth, not what somebody says is the truth, but like what really is the truth. And I think it's because we all grew up in this fiat system and fiat is just a lie. It's It, it only has value by decree. It doesn't have any underlying value. It's not really backed by anything. And so Bitcoiners as a whole tend to have moved in a different direction, seeking truth and looking long term. Uh, it's just a much healthier outlook in general. Yeah. Did it make you more optimistic? Definitely. I'm yeah. definitely, even even though it feels like we're living, I don't know how you feel about this, but like the fourth turning, have you heard about mm-hmm. that kind of concept? Yeah. Even though we might be living through sort of a fourth turning right now and things could get ugly, I'm super optimistic for my kids and for my grandkids that it's going to be a much better world with yeah. Bitcoin. I agree. I think that just knowing that you can be optimistic already makes your life better without mm-hmm. even knowing what the future will be, right? Yes. Like nobody knows about the future, but just having that feeling is a great reassurance to just, yeah, you know, keep on living basically. Yes, right? you yeah. have something to live for, yeah, a better tomorrow. Yeah, we talked a bit about your long-term outlook, but what makes you most bullish? Whew. Long-term most bullish? I guess it would kind of come back to what we were just talking about is that I feel like Bitcoin is going to change the entire geopolitical world order and that for the better and that we i think people all around the world are so sick of being lied to and so sick of being told to do things that they don't agree with and there's so much division and hate in the world right now and you see some people who you know the the cantalon effect so they're closer to the money printer and they're getting they see it seems like some people just can never lose they get all the benefits of this broken system and i think w- what's encouraging is that this whole new system that's uh, that's kind of equity based and based on this proof of work it just creates an entirely different type of world and a different outlook for the world that that gives me hope i, I get really encouraged by the fact that people who are currently really struggling in the current system and being abused by debt and and you know all the practices and the shenanigans of the IMF and these other organizations that they'll be freed from that at some point and they can just start living you know basic simple good lives and be able to f- afford food and shelter for their family and for their kids yeah yeah i love that thought too and i also love the thought that probably the people that 
abused them before will be the last to adopt Bitcoin. Yeah. Uh, which are probably our governments, by the way. Yes, but, definitely. You know, again, part of this entertaining piece, I would say, right? It's, it's mm-hmm. such an interesting, you know, game theory, psychological type development. And I, and I think, and we alluded to that a bit before, but just realizing that we are living through this right now, I think is already really hard to stomach, right? Mm-hmm. That, that, that you are living through, you know, an 80 year change or the bigger one, like the, you know, some people talk about this 300 year, 250, 300 year cycle. Right? Yeah, like we are at that point. We are we are going to flip into this this new cycle. And it's just crazy to realize that, yeah, we are living now. But yeah, that's what makes it so interesting, right? That's why we're going to keep talking about it the rest of our lives, I think. Yeah. yeah, I wanted to ask you the last question that I ask everyone, which is, what is a core belief that you will never let go? About anything, just in general? Yeah. Well, I don't know if this is going to be popular, but I have a very strong core belief that there is a God and that we were created to enjoy God forever, to know and enjoy God forever, both on this earth and then when we die and uh, in the next life. A lot of Bitcoiners don't agree with that, but yeah. Well, you're not the first one to share this, so. Oh, yeah. P- probably my, that's probably my most fundamental belief. Well, thanks. Uh, thanks for sharing and thanks for this very dense conversation. Really appreciate your time. And yeah, let's stay in touch. Thanks, Bram. I appreciate you having me on your show. Cheers. I hope you enjoyed this episode. If you did, also make sure to check out this video right here or go to my page and check out all the episodes of Bitcoin for Millennials. I appreciate your support and hope to see you for another episode. Bye. 